Hello, David Pecker here, and in this video I would like to discuss with you ex exosolar planets. What are exosolar planets? These are planets that orbit stars beside their own sun. The title image shows two exosolar planets orbiting the star TYC 8998-760-1. This is a very new image. Uh, that is its cutting-edge science. It was produced in just February of 2020 by European Southern Observatory's very large telescope. This is one of the very few images sh uh, directly showing uh, more than one planet orbiting a single star. While this image is super cool because it's proof of concept showing that we can indeed observe directly planets orbiting other stars, it's also not so cool because the two planets are super Jupiters. Uh, the closer planet, called planet B, has a mass 14 times that of Jupiter, and planet C has a mass of 6 times that of Jupiter. Also, the two planets orbit kind of far away from their parent star. Uh, they orbit at a distance of 160 AU and 320 AU, which is much further than most planets in our solar system. The Earth orbits at 1 AU, uh, Jupiter orbits at um, 5.2 AU and Pluto at 39.5 AU. These large separations uh, and large masses of the planets are exactly what made it possible to image the planets in the first place. Now you might have some questions about this image, like why does the parent star look so funny? The reason for that is the light from the star has to be blocked so it doesn't overwhelm the telescope. You also see some other stars in, in the image, but these are just background stars. They're not part of the solar, uh, of the solar system being imaged. Now, how did the ESO make this image? So the very large telescope has two properties that let it produce this uh, truly awesome image. The first is it has a pretty large mirror at 8.2 meters in diameter. The second, it has a super fancy adaptive optic system. What the adaptive optic system allows us, uh, the telescope to do is to compensate for atmospheric distortion to, uh, distortions to starlight. And how this works is that the telescope projects its own guide star, that's the orange laser beam you see in this image, and then by looking at the image of the guide star, it figures out how to compensate for the atmospheric distortions. Looking at this image, you might notice an interesting feature in the night sky, and that is a ribbon of stars running diagonally across through the image. This is, of course, the Milky Way. And from uh, teaching this class in the past, I have realized that uh, most of you guys haven't seen the Milky Way before, because our skies are really not dark enough. Now, what is the Milky Way? Well, let's take a look. Our sun is just one of approximately 100 to 400 billion stars that make up our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Here, there are two artists' image, images of the Milky Way galaxies from Wikipedia. The Milky Way galaxy is shaped basically like a frisbee. It's a circle that is very thin. Now, if you look from the top, you see that the galaxy has a spiral structure, and hence it's called a spiral galaxy. Now, if we look at the galaxy edge on, we see that it's pretty thin, um, the Sun is about halfway from the center to the edge of the galaxy, and at the center of the galaxy there is what's called a central bulge, which is an uh, extra concentration of stars. Surrounding our Milky Way galaxy there is a bunch of globular clusters, which are basically little uh, galaxies that orbit our own galaxy. Now, having these basic facts about the Milky Way galaxy, what does it mean uh, for us regarding what the night sky looks like? Well, here's an image of the night sky, and we see this band of stars. And these are basically the stars that make up the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, because we are inside the disk of the Milky Way galaxy, the band of stars appears as a band around the, around the night sky. Basically, see the blue band in the image to the right as the band of stars in the image to the left. Now, the laser pointer, the guide star, is pointing towards the central bulge of the Milky Way galaxy, um, which appears as a concentration of stars in the middle of this image. Now let's get back to discussing planets. Before 1992, humankind knew about nine planets. 
In 1992, the number of known planets increased to 11, after the discovery of two planets outside of our solar system. In 1995, one more planet was discovered outside our solar system, bringing the total number of planets to 12. In uh, 2019, there are more than 4,000 confirmed extra, uh, extrasolar planets, um, and also about 3,000 extrasolar planets that have been observed but not confirmed. Which brings us to the question, what happened in mid-90s and early 2000s that allowed us to discover so many planets? And how do we know about the existence of all these planets? Now you might think that the key to the discovery of all these extrasolar planets was better telescopes or maybe better optics. But that's actually not the case. The key that made it possible to discover all these planets is computers. And the reason why we need really good computers to detect planets is that we don't detect most planets by direct imaging, but instead by variation of the starlight from their parent star. There are two basic methods for discovering extrasolar planets. The first is the transit method. And in this method, what we do is we look at a star for a prolonged period of time, and we are looking for a dip in the star brightness as a function of time. This occurs when the extrasolar planet passes between us and the star, thus dimming the, star, uh, the star's brightness. Now, in order to do the, uh, the transit method, what one needs is a telescope that can take image of the star uh, quite often. Indeed, we don't need very high resolution, we just need good photometry and frequent imaging. The WASP uh, camera array pictured uh, on the right uses actually Canon uh, lenses and um, Canon cameras uh, to take images uh, of the sky at a rate of about once per minute. And this is quite different from how conventional telescopes work. This is precisely what allows this camera array to discover extrasolar planets. The other uh, method for observing extra extrasolar planets uses the Doppler effect. What is the Doppler effect? Well, it's the effect which is responsible for the pitch of a car horn or a car siren changing as a car drives by you. Sound propagates through atom uh, the atmosphere as density waves. If the source of sound is stationary, as the fire truck in the uh, top left picture is, then the sound pitch all around the fire truck is the same. On the other hand, if the truck is driving forward, then as it's emitting waves forward, it's catching up to those waves, and as it's emitting waves backwards, it's running away from them. So the waves in front of the fire truck get compressed, and waves behind the fire truck get expanded. And therefore, the pitch uh, of the fire alarm coming from the front of the truck sounds higher, while the pitch of the fire alarm from the back of the truck sounds lower. Basically, the same thing happens for light. There is uh, one slight difference in that light is not a compression wave. Light doesn't need a medium to travel through. Just like in case of sound, the speed of light is also a fixed quantity. Now, if the source of light is moving, then the light waves in front of that object get compressed, and light waves behind that object get expanded. Now, as light waves get compressed, they are shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum, while light waves that are expanded get shifted to the red end of the spectrum. And hence, we have blue shift and red shift. Now, how do we use the Doppler effect to, to detect extrasolar planets? Suppose we have a pretty massive planet orbiting a star the star being the larger object and the planet being the smaller object. Now, the star doesn't remain fixed. In fact, the system of the two objects orbits around the center of mass, which means that as we observe the star, sometimes it's moving towards us and sometimes it's moving away from us. And therefore, the light from the star will be uh, Doppler shifted, sometimes to, towards the blue when the star is coming towards us and sometimes towards the red when the star is moving away from us. And this is, is exactly how Michael Mayer and Didier Cullos uh, discovered the planet 51 Pegasi b back in 1995. Again, this discovery used a pretty modest telescope, 
of only 1.93 meters in diameter. The data from the telescope is plotted in the graph. On the vertical axis is a star color, uh, which is a proxy for the star velocity, and on the horizontal axis is the time. And what we see is a star color and hence the star velocity is changing with a period of about uh, four days. This corresponds to the planet orbiting the star every four days and tugging back and forth on it. For their discovery of uh, 51 Pegasi B, Michael Mayer and Didier Queloz were awarded the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics, or at least half of it. Well, you might ask, what about the two planets that were discovered in 1992? Well, those two planets orbit a pulsar, as opposed to a conventional star. A pulsar is a rapidly rotating neutron star, which is basically a relic of a star that has died. Consequently, the discovery of planets around pulsar, while quite interesting, is perhaps a bit less interesting than planets orbiting regular stars, as it's very unlikely that planets orbiting pulsars could, could ever sustain life. Here are just three of the space missions uh, that sent telescopes to space to look for extrasolar planets. Now, all three of these missions use a transit method to detect planets. And indeed, the transit method has become the dominant method used nowadays to look for extrasolar planets. Now, you might be wondering about two questions. Why should we put telescopes in space to look for extrasolar planets? And why are these telescopes so small? So what are the advantages of putting the, uh, these planet hunting telescopes into space? Well, this allows for continuous observations of the stars, which is uh, crucial for actually observing uh, planet transit. Earth-bound telescopes, even at best meteorological locations, can only observe for about half the time, because the other half the time it's daylight. And the key to all of these missions is to observe uh, a large number of stars continuously, and that is precisely why they use pretty modest telescopes, as opposed to giant telescopes, which would be much better to observing just a single star. Over the past decade and a half, our view of extrasolar planets has fundamentally changed. Starting in 95, we have discovered planet after planet after planet. This change is exemplified by the NASA catalog of extrasolar planets, currently containing over 4,200 planets. Due to the limitations of our observation techniques, most of these planets are not Earth-like at all. Most of them are really large. As you see, there is a bunch of planets listed at the front of the catalog, which are super Jupiters. But the prevalence of solar systems does indicate that there is a high probability of finding other planets much like our own. Thank you for watching, and remember to stay curious.